Good evening and welcome to The Jury, the show where you, the people of Australia, sit in judgment on the issues confronting the nation. Coming up on tonight's show, Albo is coming after the car you drive. That's right, the Aussie Ute is in the PM's firing line as Labor's electric vehicle crusade sets its sights on reducing climate emissions. Calls for Chinese-owned app TikTok to be banned over national security concerns, but the PM's not budging. Barnaby Joyce will fire up on why he thinks we are too soft on China. Meanwhile, with youth crime at crisis levels, we ask, should parents be held responsible for the crimes of their children? This week, a Labor visa bungle saw arrested immigration detainees walk free. Are our borders weaker under Labor? Plus, that now infamous photo of Princess Kate. There they are, this week's jury, ready to weigh up the arguments and deliver their verdict. Before they do, we'll hear from expert witnesses and some of your favourite Sky News contributors. The courtroom is now in session. Let's get into it. Sky News Australia presents The Jury with Danica DiGiorgio. Well, the next federal election is shaping up to be a ute tax election as the fight over Labor's emission reduction plan for cars and utes shifts into top gear. Manufacturers will face fines unless they lower the carbon intensity of their fleets by more than 60% by the end of the decade. It's been touted as Labor's great climate change market intervention, though the PM insists petrol cars are not being banned. The Federal Chamber of Automotive Industries warns the proposed emission standard will push up the price of popular models like the Ford Raptor by $6,000 and some other models by $25,000. Already, Australia's three most popular vehicles sold in 2023 all emit 194 grams of carbon per kilometre on average, meaning the Ford Ranger, Toyota Hilux and Isuzu D-Max are under threat under Albo and Bowen's blueprint. Our first question for the jury is... Is the government trying to kill off youths? Joining us now is Liberal Senator Holly Hughes, former Assistant Shadow Minister for Climate Change and Energy, plus Tim Buckley, Director of Climate Energy Finance. Thank you so much to both of you for joining us on the panel. Holly, we'll start with you. Is the great Aussie Ute about to become a thing of the past? This is an absolute tax grab by this government. I mean, yet again, we see Casanova Bowen mm. racing racing too hard and too fast here in a bid to chase this emissions target that he's consistently just setting for himself. Uh, it's six years that we're looking till they want this 60% standard uh, to be put into place. It is going to push up the cost. Australia itself is a very unique market, yet Bowen seems to have no comprehension of this. We've got a generation of kids who apparently have climate change anxiety. What Bowen is doing is setting up the Australian family and the Australian tradie to go into range anxiety. We know that there's not enough options when it comes to charging, but we also know that there are not enough options when it comes to SUVs and utes uh, in these electric vehicles. They just simply don't exist. The few that do exist are left-hand drive, and cost over $100,000. Wow. So what does this mean? It means that Australian tradies and Australian families are going to keep what they've got for longer. That's going to lead to higher emissions. And it is absolutely a bid to tax the ute out of existence. I mean, this is a, quite a big plan by the government, Tim, that's been handed down. I mean, surely you've got to concede they're coming after the ute. I absolutely categorically reject that uh, conclusion. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, I mean, we've had an absolute misinformation campaign from the opposition, the federal opposition, and uh, unfortunately tonight we've just heard that yet again, that uh, it's a tax. There is no tax involved. It is not a new tax. We've had ABC Fact Check and ABC Checkmate categorically say that there is no new tax and that the statements of the LOP are categorically wrong. Uh, there are a number of reasons why this is very, very sensible strategy to drag Australia into the current century. Mm -hmm. Our emission standards are some of the worst in the world. India, China, Europe, America all have emission standards. Mm -hmm. 
It's about time Australia joined the rest, 85% of the rest of the world, and actually have some standards, some emissions controls on our vehicles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So apart from the misinformation campaign, to me, electric vehicles are brilliant. We import in Australia $60 billion a year of oil and diesel. That is a massive energy security risk for our country. It's a massive economic headwind for our economy. And so to me, I'd much rather use domestic, cheap and clean energy to, to fuel our vehicles. Does he raise a good point here that we, we risk being left behind if we don't go down this pathway, Holly? Absolutely not. And I, I mean, it's good to see, Tim, you reading the Labor talking points on this fuel efficiency standard. The Coalition's actually not opposed to a fuel efficiency standard. We are opposed to what Bowen is trying to introduce because, again, it's too fast, it's too hard, too and we fast. don't have the infrastructure. 85% of the world already we has standards. Yeah, the not laggard, this harsh. Not and 4,000 dealers we, in the US, over 50 states, have just written to Biden and said, you've got to put the handbrake on this. We are yeah. not those markets. China emits 29% of the world emissions. We emit 1%. Of our emissions, transport is 19%, cars are 45%. It is a minuscule amount of our emissions on the global stage, yet we are going to be punished. We have a completely different environment mm -hmm. to any of those countries that we're being compared to in the distances that we drive and the way that the Australian economy operates. Greater it is fuel an absolute efficiency standards furphy, will benefit an absolute Country, that this users. is a cost of living measure. Okay. It is going but to cost Australians more. Yeah. Every single one of these cars, there aren't enough charges. The infrastructure yeah. is 60,000 to 100,000 per fast yes. charger. Yeah. They do not exist yet. No one is saying we are not going to ultimately get there. We are not going to get there at the pace well, Bowen wants us Tim, to. Tim, I mean, you talk about the regions, um, yep. but if we look at farmers, for example, they particularly rely on utes. And as I mentioned in the introduction, Ford Ranger, Toyota Hilux, Isuzu D-Max, they're all, all under threat because of this new policy. This the not... farmers in particular, the tradies, what about them? Do you think that that is going to have an impact? They're not under threat because what this will do is encourage the supply of new vehicles into Australia. Mm -hmm. All of those vehicles will still be available mm -hmm. and it'll be about increasing the range, the alternative okay. choices that consumers okay. have. I mean, basic right, well, economics wanna... tells you that's wrong. We are 1% of the global car market. We are a right-hand market. We are a small market. Isuzu does not have a vehicle that it can put in place. Okay. And it's not the coalition putting out any misinformation. It is all of the automotive industry groups. Let's, let's go and to the, the only two that have left, Tesla and Polestar, because they're going to make all the money from the new tax when they're having to buy the credit. Let's go to the jury. Uh, Grant in the back row. What do you think about this? Do you think the government's trying to kill off you? When the market is not doing what the government wants it to do, the government wants to intervene into that. So where you have millions of decisions made by consumers every day to suit their individual circumstance, uh, and then you you uh, defer that to a, a handful of um, bureaucrats making decisions on behalf of millions of people. Mm. You don't get the consumer choice. Mm. You don't get the, uh, um, the needs met by the people who, within that market. Mm. If we're going to be relying on electric vehicles, the question has to come back to um, Australia and Canada are the highest producers of uranium, mm. yet we don't have nuclear energy here. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a whole, yeah, that's a whole yeah. different separate topic, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. That's a whole different, <laughs> different matter. This is what we're talking uh, about. No, it's true. Look, it's a good, it's yep. a good one. Uh, Samantha, what about you? Do you think that the government's trying to kill off youths? Uh, I do. I look at it and I think we're going to increase the cost of everything. We have trades who already struggle to get to places on time mm -hmm. to do the jobs in someone's domestic house. But mm -hmm. if you're going to limit the ability for how far they could go, how many jobs are they going to be able to do it a day and then how much are they going to have to charge because they need to make the same amount of money? Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I respond to that? Yes, because by all at means. the end of the day, the range anxiety was absolutely... I hear your point. Five years ago, ten years ago, battery technology was last century. It is expanding phenomenally. Last year, 30% of all cars sold in China, 8.1 million cars in China were electric vehicles. China is expanding its share of electric vehicles 10% per annum. Their target is 80 to 90% by the end of this decade. We won't be able to buy internal combustion engines because foreign manufacturers won't be producing them next decade. If we don't start getting ready for it, mm. we'll miss out. We're already the world's laggard and you won't yeah. actually be able to import those vehicles because they won't be well, manufacturing uh, them. Uh, Dura, uh, Damien, what, what do you think about that? We've got to start getting ready now for the Look, future. Absolutely, absolutely D Danica, we do. Um, I think the only thing I really agreed with uh, that uh, electric cars are brilliant. Mm -hmm. 
unless you want to go somewhere, right? We don't have the infrastructure in place. And typical of governments, right, we do all these piecemeal policies, but we don't have a plan, right? We still we don't have nuclear energy, we mentioned that. But, but if I go from Sydney to, to Melbourne, I'm going to run out of uh, energy, aren't I? I'm going to stop somewhere. Then I have to wait, what, 10 hours for other people to get their charge mm -hmm. first? We really need a plan for Australia, not these piecemeal policies, because mm -hmm. we're not going to move anywhere into the next future. Yeah. Well, and the other thing is, if, if the jury and everyone else at home that's driving a petrol car or a diesel car at the moment, you're paying the fuel excise. You're paying for the roads, not electric vehicle owners. And we'd, we're not allowed to talk about, though, the excess weight on the roads by the weight of these batteries. No one's talking about excess brake uh, fumes being emitted because of the usage of brakes driving an electric vehicle. We're not talking about the rubber particulates that are being emitted at a much faster rate off electric vehicles into the air because of the additional weight of cars. No one's talking about the disposal of these batteries and no one is talking about the use of Uyghur slave labour in a whole lot of this battery creation. So, yeah. you know, it's not about saying no right. fuel efficiency let's, standards. Let's not it's about doing it sensibly. Let's Tip not spend $60 billion a year fueling the Middle East. Let's actually invest that $60 billion. That's it's how not going to be spent here. Diesel. It's going to be spent in China. And no, let me tell you, the they're not fuel, driving not from the Beijing to car. Wuhan, but you want to drive from Moree to Sydney. And the technology is improving unbelievably. Yeah, so so to the point about the charges, we expanded charges as a country, 70% last year, we'll expand them again 100% in the next one okay. to two Bowen years. Bowen wants right. it by next year. Bowen wants it by next year. Let the technology catch up right. rather than racing so that well, Bowen we'll can see. stand we'll at, you know, we'll 28. See. We'll have to see if we can get to that point. But look, you've both had your say. It is time now to call on the jury. Jurors, you have 10 seconds to decide. Is the government trying to kill off youths? <laughs> Jury members, what have you decided? Yes, a majority verdict. You all believe that, yes, the government is indeed trying to kill off youths. Hugo, why yes? Oh, well, look, I think... This is another classic example of the Labor government not listening to the majority of Australians. You've got the most yep. popular vehicles in Australia are non-electric and they're going to make it more difficult for people to buy these vehicles and to sustain the cost of these vehicles in the middle of a cost yep. of living crisis. This is going to hurt them in the next election. Uh, Annalise, uh, you were nodding your head there. What, what do you think? Yes, policy that is not set with principle is a very poor um, choice and 75% of all the lithium-ion batteries, which um, make these EVs is actually produced in China. So we'll be actually stimulating China yep. and strengthening them. Which is something that Holly uh, mentioned before. Yep. Uh, Eloise, why, why do you think that the government is trying to kill off youths? Yeah, I just think we should do things incrementally and I feel like this is going too hard too fast and it's going to hurt people. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what do you think about that, Tim? That we, we, we are rushing in a direction that we're perhaps we're not quite ready for yet as a country. India's already got emission standards. Europe's got them. America's got them. China's got them. Japan's got them. We are not going too fast. We're actually a global laggard. OK. All right. Well, look, I mean, it's a fascinating debate. Tim Buckley, Holly Hughes, great to have you both on the panel. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Well, let's move on now, because the PM is being urged to ban the Chinese Communist Party-linked app TikTok after the US House of Representatives passed a bill that may lead to a nationwide ban in the States. But as so often is the case when it comes to China, Albo's not taking a hard line. He's all but ruled out banning it here. This week, China indicated it would drop tariffs on Australian wine. But let's not forget the reason they were there in the first place. Australia demanded transparency from China on the origins of COVID and we got punished for it. Albo has been focused on dethawing frosty bilateral relations since. The reality is being tough on China doesn't suit Labor economically or politically. The ALP thinks it won the last election based in part on winning Chinese-dominated seats. They took a softer position than the coalition on the threat of China. But with the current geopolitical landscape, is now the time for Albo to stand his ground on Beijing? Our next question for the jury, are we too soft on China? Joining us now is Barnaby Joyce, former Deputy PM and Deputy Chair of the National Security Council versus James Lawrenson, Director of the Australian-China Relations Institute. Hi to both of you. Thanks for joining us this evening. Barnaby, why do you think we are too soft on China? Well, I don't think it's unique to China. As I always say, the powerful will do as they will and the weak will suffer as they must. 
And China, by its very nature, whether it was the Tang Dynasty, the Qing Dynasty, Yuan Dynasty, even the Republic of China, has always has been bigger than it is at the moment. Mm. And they have, I believe, a manifest destiny of where they should go. They're not a democracy. They're a totalitarian regime with a sort of a unitary point of control. And our experience with it, there's not one country in their perimeter who hasn't got some territorial dispute. Russia just has to wait around a little while and they'll want to go back there. Paracel Islands, India, we've seen the dispute in northern India. Um, Philippine vessels were recently rammed by China and that has to call into question whether the 1951 agreement with uh, the United States of, of basically support for the Philippines will be brought into play. We just have to realise that when we go to what the start of what I said, the powerful will do as they will and the weak will suffer as they must, mm. that we have to become as powerful as possible as quickly as possible. Mm. And we need a sense of self-dignity to be able to stand behind that. And what we're doing to this nation at the moment, I mean, the Chinese will be clapping all the way uh, to, to all, all, all the way to the Forbidden Palace with us destroying our power, our electricity capacity, mm. putting all these caveats on us. Um, it's just a matter of, it's not what I say, look at the realities of what exactly is happening in the world mm. and ask yourself, are you naive enough to think it's going to be different in history for you mm. or are you smart enough to do something about it? All right. Well, uh, James, just on that point, we've had tariffs, the bullying, uh, the successful recruitment, uh, as Barnaby just said, of an Australian pol politician by an espionage ring. Why don't you think we need to take a tougher stance on China? Yeah, all those examples, right? China tried to hit us with trade to punish our economy, right? They tried to infiltrate us with spies. Did they succeed? No, they failed, 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 right? When they hit our wine, that had, had caused a bit of pain when they hit our barley, our coal, our copper, our cotton. Mm -hmm. Our producers shrugged their shoulders. Why? Because they sell them to global markets, overnight, low cost, bang. It actually hurt China more than it hurt us. <laughs> Worried about spies? Great. We put in place foreign interference laws. That's exactly what we did. And two weeks ago, we got our first conviction, right? So this idea that, look, Danica, I'm not trying to pretend that China's this lovely, cuddly place that we should, you know, snuggle up to, sure. right? But the point is, we're not defenceless, right? And, and I think that's the bigger mm. point to make. I'm not arguing that we're, you know, we're too hard on China. China and that, you know, we've got to be a bit softer and a bit more gentle because we don't want to make Beijing angry or, or, or sad. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, are we too soft? No, absolutely not. Look, 2021, mm -hmm. uh, we were all worried about the Chinese military, so we struck the AUKUS agreement, right, that mm -hmm. under the Morrison yeah. government, right, working with the United States and the UK. Beijing was bloody unhappy. We did it anyway. Mm -hmm. what, what's the Albanese government done? He's doubled down on the AUKUS agreement, right? So the point is we can defend ourselves. There's some things that some Australians would like the Australian government to do that we mm -hmm. haven't done. Right. One mm. example there is some people would like the Australian government to cancel the lease that a Chinese company holds to operate the port of Darwin. Yeah. Let's be clear, Abbott didn't tear it up, Morrison didn't tear it up, Albanese didn't tear it up, and the reason they didn't tear it up wasn't because we're scared of China, it's because our defence agencies and our security agencies said we could handle the well, risk. Well, okay. I think that the, the, the issue here is um, we should never have let it through in the first place. I okay. mean, it was, um, the fact is that, well, you know, the AUKUS agreement is going to look after us. The AUKUS agreement doesn't come into play till about 2040. So we, we better hold our breath and, and do a lot of praying between now and then. Barnaby, you're not our suggesting defense, China's going to come down through South now, Asia I, well, and invade on, I'll, Northern I'll, I'll Territory, take, are you? I'll take come you up on, on that. Give me a break. Not even Wang, our Defence Department Lee, is saying Wang that. Wang Yi has had visits to Dili, the Solomon Islands, Port Moresby, uh, negotiations with Kiribati, Cook Islands. Now, what do all these countries do? And there's they still bloody no Chinese base on any of those places, right? This is Australia. the point. We can this defend ourselves. This is exactly ourselves. following the playbook from what the Japanese did. The encirclement oh, of Australia... On. The Japanese is, actually had puts, the military posted us, in those places. They're militarising the South China Sea. They've yeah. taken over these <laughs> yeah. islands. The South the China nine, Sea, by the way, is right line. next to the China. Nine dash it's not next to Australia. The Nine Dash Line came in and they just basically took over. But here's the thing. If right. you look at it, it goes right Let's down to Indonesia, up to Malaysia, Royal and they Australian said, oh, no, that's, Navy. Part, that's part of China. Right. That's part of China. Going up that's and down the China, China coast right. every it's, single right. day. It's, we don't have Chinese okay. vessels off the coast of Australia.